On today's episode, Starship has another rough ride, an unexpected lunar mission from China, and we learn the secret to growing plants in space. The SpaceX Starship launched for the third time on March 14th, and what we saw was the closest thing yet to a fully successful test flight, but unfortunately, Starship still has some issues. Thanks to four onboard Starlink transmitters mounted in the nose cone of the rocket, viewers were treated to amazingly clear video feeds from exterior cameras as the vehicles ascended into space and came most of the way back down again. Just like the second test flight, this one began with an easy liftoff. All 33 Raptor engines lit up and pushed the rocket off of the orbital launch mount at the Starbase launch pad, its water deluge system keeping the powerful engines from causing major damage. After a textbook acceleration phase at the 2 minute 44 second mark, all but three of the first stage booster's engines shut down, giving time for the Starship upper stage to light its engines in a hot staging maneuver that allowed the two vehicles to separate smoothly. What comes next is a pivotal moment for the booster, because this is where it exploded last time. The energy released from the hot stage pushes the booster into a 180 degree flip that brings the main engines around to prepare for a boost backburn, and unlike with flight number 2, this is where we saw the successful relight of the 13 inner raptors that were able to slow the booster down for a drop back into the Gulf of Mexico. From here, the booster is coming down fast, much faster than your typical Falcon 9, because instead of performing a re-entry burn to continue losing velocity and shield the rocket from the impact into the atmosphere, the Super Heavy just free falls directly from outer space like a lawn dart. As the rocket starts to punch through the upper cloud layers at over 1,000 kilometers per hour, we get the first indications of trouble. The onboard camera gives us a close-up view of one of the four aerodynamic grid fins, and we can see it working incredibly hard to try and keep the rocket stable as it begins to pitch and roll through the air. At the same time, the booster engines are supposed to be relighting again for a final landing burn, but only three of the 13 Raptors come back, two in the center cluster and one in the middle ring. Even these don't last long as they almost instantly begin to drop out again. It's at this combined moment of engine failure and aerodynamic instability that we lose the video feed from the Super Heavy. SpaceX confirms that the booster experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly at approximately 462 meters in altitude. With the fate of the booster sealed, all eyes shifted to the Starship upper stage as it completed its own six-engine burn and began the coasting phase at a just slightly less than orbital velocity of over 26,000 kilometers per hour and an altitude of over 170 kilometers high. As the rocket glides through space, the team on the ground at Starbase have a 30-minute window to perform the first-ever in-flight systems tests on a Starship, which is a huge milestone. First up is the payload door, also known as the PEZ dispenser, which will eventually be used to deploy Starlink V2 satellites. Switching over to an internal camera view, we can see the slot open just enough to let a bit of light come in and allow some atmosphere to escape. What we don't see is a whole lot of movement from the door itself. The mechanism never seems to fully open up or close back down. But much more importantly was the very first test of cryogenic fuel transfer between the Starship's header and main tanks. There's no way to see this happening, but SpaceX calls the test successful. This propellant transfer is a big deal for showing NASA that Starship is progressing towards a lunar landing for Artemis 3. One final test that SpaceX had to abort during the flight was the relight of a Raptor engine in orbit. This will be critical in future missions, where the Starship actually reaches a full orbital velocity and needs to slow itself back down in order to re-enter the atmosphere. But the team chose to abort the relight due to an unexpected new problem. This is where things really go off the rails. As you can see from the onboard camera views, Starship has begun rolling around as it coasts through space. Now, this provides some spectacular views of the Earth as the camera rotates, but it's definitely not what's supposed to be happening up there. Trying to judge the orientation of the rocket from the camera is pretty difficult, but according to the telemetry box, the ship is pointing in the wrong direction as it begins to re-enter the atmosphere. At this point, the hot gas thrusters should be working to keep the ship on course and in a stable orientation, but 
For whatever reason, they don't seem to be having any effect at all. At the same time, we can also see a lot of debris floating around outside of the ship. No one is really sure what these chunks are. There's likely some ice breaking off the surface of the vehicle as it attempts to regain control, but we definitely see some solid material in the mix too. It's not long before the starship begins impacting the first air molecules in the upper atmosphere, and now we start to get toasty. So, as a 9 meter diameter metal tube traveling at 26,000 kilometers per hour hits that layer of gas, the molecules are going to compress, and when you compress a gas, it heats up. The more violent the compression, the more intense the heat produced. We can see this visually as red hot plasma starts to build up under the wing below the camera. Starship is still pointed ass down, but at least the heat shield is facing in the right direction until it's not. We can see a lot of movement from the aero flaps as they work to try and right the ship, but without attitude control from the thrusters, the wings are fighting a losing battle. The death blow to the starship comes 46 minutes into the flight. We can see the re-entry profile change as the ship rolls over onto its side. Now instead of seeing the hot plasma contained under the heat shield, it's burning up both sides of the rocket and into the engine bay where a huge fireball erupts as the rocket flips over again. As the ship continues to tumble through the atmosphere, the video gets pretty spotty. All we really see is flaming gas and glowing hot metal. Even with all of this, the ship still hasn't actually slowed down much and is still moving at 26,000 km per hour as the air continues to thicken around it. Starship lost contact about 65 kilometers above the surface. Everyone's pretty sure it broke up as it was falling. The ship wouldn't have vaporized, but it likely came down as a cluster of flaming hot half-melted chunks that was far away from any civilization and way out over the Indian Ocean. Now, obviously, this flight went much better than IFT-2. SpaceX hit most of the primary mission goals and even managed to attempt a controlled re-entry of both vehicles all good data that they can use for the next flight. On February 2nd, the SpaceX social media accounts posted that they already have boosters ready for the next three flights, and a fourth is ready to be constructed in the Mega Bay at Starbase. The FAA will be making a mishap investigation, of course, but SpaceX has been steadily working with the government agency to shave down the time between launches. The time between IFT-1 and 2 was about seven months, then IFT-3 happens less than four months after that. Considering how fast the company is getting at prepping their new launch vehicles and refurbishing the equipment, the next gap will likely be shorter. Could the next flight be in May? On March 14th, the Chinese state agency Xinhua announced that the country's most recent launch had not gone as planned and the payload had wandered off course at some point after reaching orbit. The payload in question was two satellites named DROA and DROB, which appeared to have been intended for use in lunar orbit, but according to Xinhua, the two spacecraft had not been put into the correct orbit after separating from their Long March 2C rocket. From the official announcement, it seems like the Yuanjiang 1S upper stage suffered some sort of malfunction that changed the mission's trajectory. It's not known just yet if the mission can be saved or repurposed like Astrobotics Peregrine Lander was back in January, using the failed lander to gather important data for the next run, it's also not known what orbit the satellites are actually in. In fact, we don't know a whole lot more about this mission at all, thanks mostly to the Chinese government keeping it a secret for almost 24 hours. Despite the timing of the announcement from Xinhua, the Long March rocket had actually lifted off the day before, with only the Taiwanese Ministry of National Defense posting a tracking announcement of a launch vehicle on social media. But while a mysterious lunar launch seems a bit suspicious at first glance, this is definitely more like the Chinese media covering for a failure than anything nefarious. A big clue to that was that China had issued closure notices for the airspace around their satellite launch facility a few days before the event, so they weren't trying to hide anything before the launch. The notices themselves also reportedly indicated that the rocket was headed further out than low Earth orbit. The US Space Force had also not noticed any new objects in low Earth orbit, which is a good indicator that the vehicle had moved into a much higher orbit where things are harder to track. Usually, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation posts a report about any launches fairly soon afterwards, but this time, they were curiously absent until the Xinhua announcements 
the next day, which makes this seem like the Chinese space agencies were trying to figure out what had gone wrong before making anything public. Going just by their name alone, it seems like these satellites were meant to enter a distant retrograde orbit of the moon, the same orbit used by Artemis 1 due to its stability. This tracks with a paper published in the Chinese Journal of Deep Space Exploration regarding the use of a DRO position around the moon for anything from communication to navigation and surface monitoring. This paper actually details the use of two satellites in this orbit, along with another placed in low Earth orbit, to give a landing craft a much sharper, high-precision set of navigation data to work with when setting down on the lunar surface. In fact, this third satellite, the DRO-L, had been launched back in February. From the looks of things, this launch was intended to start and test a lunar communications network for China's upcoming moon missions, something the country has been very publicly eager to begin, even announcing back in February that they want to put Chinese astronauts on the moon before 2030. China has famously been cut out of most international partnerships by the US, and so it makes sense that they would need to set up their own communications network before making their first attempts at getting a crew to the moon. This mission seems like a relatively minor setback in that effort, it's just strange how they kept it a secret. New research into plant farming in space has led a team from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to develop a new type of wearable sensor to help track the needs of space-borne vegetables. They called it the Stretchable Polymer Electronics-Based Autonomous Remote Strain Sensor, or SPEARS-2. Led by biomolecular engineer Professor Ying Dao and plant biology professor Andrew Leakey, the team at U Illinois has spent the last three years coming up with a type of polymer-based electronic device that could stretch along with a growing plant and wirelessly transmit the needs of the growing food source. This meant that they had to develop a sensor that could handle different levels in humidity and temperature as well as stretch by over 400% while still staying attached and continuing to monitor the crops for a crew of astronauts who could very well be relying on them for long-term nutrition. And despite thinking that the problem would only take a couple of months to crack, printing and assembling a suitable structure without the internal microstructures that make up this sensor forming large, rigid crystals was very difficult. Eventually, the team settled on a film-like design that could handle the growth without this issue. It is an exciting technical advance in our ability to perform precise, non-invasive measurements of plant growth in real time, said Andrew Leakey. From here, the team plans on experimenting to figure out how to incorporate their sensor into outwards growing plants rather than just the upwards growing ones like corn. Growing plants in microgravity has been a challenge that space agencies have tried to tackle for some time now, but especially since the 2010s, a big push to learn how crops can be made sustainable in low gravity environments has taken place. Roots, stems, and leaves all grow differently without gravity holding them in place. The extra moisture and gases taken in and breathed out by plants changes the careful environment of a space station, and even something as simple as watering a plant gets very difficult in space. But if we are going to be spending more time in space, we're going to need to figure out how to sustainably farm onboard our ships as they take us to Mars and beyond. Spears 2 and other sensors like it get us closer to that reality.